Hi, everyone. This is the Wellbeing Designers podcast. My name is Reka Deak. I am your host. In the first season of the podcast, we will meet the first generation of well-being leaders. They are the ones who are called head of well-being or similar in big organizations. Their responsibility is to navigate through the growing amount of well-being offerings to create value for employees by also keeping the executive leadership team engaged about the topic of well-being. They are proving that investing into well-being pays off and creates sustainable performance and business success. They are well-being designers. Our guest today is Urs Karkoska. Urs was the first ever appointed head of human performance innovation at Novartis. This role was created in 2017, and he was holding it until very recently, end of 2022. Novartis is a global pharma company headquartered in Switzerland, employing 110,000 people worldwide. As head of human performance innovation, Urs has been focusing on innovative ideas to bring human performance in Novartis to the next level. One of the key priorities is to ensure all Novartis associates are aware and use various tools and strategies that positively impact their brain and body in a sustainable way. He was also leading the implementation of mindfulness in Novartis. He joined Novartis back in 2005, and in all his roles, he developed a passion for cultural transformation. He holds a PhD in industrial organizational psychology. He is married with two kids and he lives in Germany. He is also a ski instructor, loves working in the garden and has a passion for soccer. So welcome Urs. I am very, very happy to have you here today with us. Thank you, Reka. Thanks for inviting me. We are all curious about why you chose well-being as your focus especially in the last few years at Novartis? Yeah, so my passion is, so it started actually for myself. So I'm, I'm getting curious about my mind, my body, about why am I reacting in certain ways, in certain situations? How does the mind work? I'm very conscious about my body, about my sleep and so on. So I, I really got into it, uh, curious about it. Uh, we worked with a company called Tignum probably 10, 12 years back. And <clears throat> we also taught the top uh, couple of thousand, four or 5,000 leaders in Novartis about that. Uh, to ensure that they have sustainable high impact or sustainable high performance. And about five, six years ago, the head of HR of Novartis asked me, can you bring this not just to the leaders, but to all associates? So that's how the role was created. Well, this is a really cool way to jump into this from your personal passion and then bring this to the company where you work. Could you share more about uh, the well-being at Novartis, so how everything started, why was it important back then to create this role? Yeah, luckily the impact that training had on the leaders in Novartis was very positive. So obviously it was positive in the work context. To be honest, it was actually more impactful in the private context. So working 10, 12 hours as a senior leader in Novartis, the family or the private life uh, suffered. And, and so the tools and strategy we learned and taught them were really helpful to find the right balance. Because in all honesty, while we love our company, we even love more our family. So how can we give them equal energy, equal impact, equal attention, or even more. So how can you change your day so that you are not exhausted towards the end of the day and your mind is even at the dinner table with the family is still with the company. So how do you transition from work to home? 
those kinds of things to make sure the life gets more in balance. Mm -hmm. And that was very impactful. And so the head of HR said, it's actually unfair to give that just to the leaders of the organization. Can we give it to all 110,000 associates? And that's why the role was created. So basically it started before 2017 as a usual training more for the leaders. Yes. And through the impact that you were creating there, it just grew out yeah. of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and then it became part of the cultural transformation at Novartis, which is exactly for me the right place. So it could be under DNI, it could be under culture, talent management, organizational development. So that was my home for the last years. And, and once it's embedded into the cultural transformation, then it really is clear that it's not just a quick fix. It's really a long game and also a game in which we learn from quarter to quarter, from data to data, what works, what doesn't work. And it's never particularly in well-being, the situation where you, you do something and this works for all associates. As a matter of fact, we have 110,000 different solutions for our associates. That's interesting, but it also makes it very challenging. I am happy that you mentioned that because there are so many different associates at Novartis from researchers, scientists, uh, different types of office worker, non-office worker. So maybe we could dive a bit deeper into that. You mentioned about the Energize for Life initiative. Could you give us a bit of an insight? What was that exactly and how it impacted this? very diverse group of employees. So basically we looked at well-being holistically. Many companies out there focus on mental well-being or mental health, particularly during the lockdown period, because that is obviously a very prominent part of your well-being. But I want to share one story. The former head of HR uh, was saying, I got a bit depressed not being able to go to the office and, and I was really concerned that something is wrong with my mental well-being. When he then looked at our definition, he realized that he also stopped exercising during lockdown. And so the root cause of not feeling well was actually physical well-being. And when he realized that he then got also better mentally again, so that balance physical, mental and social well-being is very important for us because at different phases during the week or even during the day, the root cause of not feeling well can be different. And if you are self-aware enough and listen to your body and mind, you'll figure out what it is that could help you to bring you back on a better well-being. It's not just again, do this and then you will feel the impact because that may change from hour to hour during the day. What about skeptical people? Sometimes what I see that whoever is a bit skeptical about the importance of mental well-being interventions, if you catch these people on the physical level and maybe show them how the physical well-being connects to the mental well-being, that's something powerful. Yeah, also, absolutely. I don't have to quote any statistics or experiments. I have to look at myself. When the lockdown started, I saved an hour a day for commuting. And I had to get up later in the morning. So what did I do? I stayed up longer and watched another Netflix series because I could sleep a bit longer. So my sleep got actually worse. So again, the physical impact then led to a potentially mental lack of well-being. And so again, I found this extremely important that we help all 110,000 associates to get this awareness, being mindful about their day, what they need, what they can do, what's in their control, what's out of control, and really make sure that they are not just being in autopilot throughout the day, that they have those moments of pause, micro breaks, of slowing down, 
to make sure and tune in, ideally with closed eyes, and tune in and say, hmm, maybe I could do a power nap. Maybe I could go out and, and do a walk. Maybe I could watch a funny movie. And those small little things, if they sum up, they will be good for your well-being overall. And it's really breaking this down rather than say you have to meditate an hour each day or you have to go to the gym and run for an hour. That is unrealistic. But if you break it down in small bits and pieces, the impact is as strong as one hour of meditation. So you mentioned the physical, mental and the social aspects. Could you give us an example how a Novartis employee was experiencing uh, energized for life? First of all, we have to be clear that we haven't reached 110,000 associates. Mm -hmm. So over the years, I would say we probably reached, if we analyze our data, between 30 and 40,000 associates. So you could say, wow, only a third of the organization you reached, or you could say, wow, you've reached 30 to 40,000 associates and helped them to get well. So we are far away from every single associates in Novartis could say, yes, Energize for Life has helped me to do this. So that's small disclaimer. But then we had two approaches. One was approach, we build the individual capabilities and skills through webinars, through training, through e-learns and so on. So each and every single associate could find on an app, on an e-learn, on the intranet, ways to take care of their own well-being. And the second approach was, how can we integrate well-being into the way we work means culture? So how can we make our performance reviews so that they have an element of well-being in it? And the, the leader can ask the question, how can I support you better so that you can take care of your well-being. And it may be that we shouldn't have a meeting at, at eight because at eight, I bring my kids. Can we do it at 8.15 or 8.30? And therefore you need to have those individual <clears throat> awareness so that they say this impacts my well-being and they have the courage and the invitation from the leaders to bring this up so that in that process of day-to-day -day work, it's integrated rather than being as something on top or isolated. So those were our two approaches for all associates. And then the approach, how can we make our products, our employee experience more mindful? So leaders played a key role in this, as I understand. How was the support from the top management or leadership at Novartis. Yeah, again, <clears throat> this can't be done in isolation by our team. Therefore, we had a very close collaboration with other uh, functions and in particular with the leadership development group where we ensured that in all leadership trainings, elements of well-being and elements of mindfulness were integrated. And so, <clears throat> again, it was not... You have to do this, this, and this, and on top you have to do well-being, but how can you make sure that you integrate well-being into your leadership approach to your team or in one-to-ones conversations with your associates? So that was particularly important, and that's also how we met, Reka. Yes. Um, that if we integrate well-being, we want to make the original program or offering better. And with that approach, obviously, the receiving unit or leadership development says, okay, if you can help me to make our program more impactful, that's great. How much do you agree with the statement that well-being is a strategy? Well, it's foundational. Leaders in general have a very good support system. So they have an assistant who helps them. They have a team who, who do certain things. But if you break it down further to the, the single associates, they don't have that support system. And with the lockdown, that support system of the leaders to a certain degree broke down or they had to take care of the kids at home. They didn't have a separate room and so on. So leaders experienced more the life of their associates and they got much more sensitive on, oh my God, you're a 
a single mom or dad at home with two young kids, I never felt that this is so um, stressful for you. So I have much more sympathy despite you're having that situation. How can I help you to make sure that I am there for you so that you can take care and bring your best self to work as well, your best self at home. If there was one positive thing about the lockdown, it's certainly the awareness of the leaders of the challenges of their associates increased. And that allowed for a better conversation on how to make it better in the future. And whatever new <clears throat> future, new way of working there will be. What was uh, the most impactful well-being intervention, either connected to this example or something else? What comes to your mind, what you are really proud of? The most impactful, because we also made it mandatory for all 20,000 leaders, was an e-learn that we created. All leaders had to go through a 30, 35 minutes well-being program in which it was not a classical e-learn. It was really something where in between the e-learn, you have to do something for your well-being. So you have to do a, a schedule, a check-in meeting with your associates, or you have to make sure that in the next team meeting, there is an agenda that looks different to the previous team meeting. So it was a very real-time actionable uh, e-learn. And we looked at the Our Voice data of those leaders before and after. Our Voice is the uh, quarterly employee survey at Novartis. So obviously not individually, but aggregated. So all 20,000. And we saw that in many dimensions, th those who have taken the e-learn had a higher work-life balance and certain other elements that we measured. That definitely was one of the most impactful ones, but also the many, many offerings for mindfulness, self-awareness, self-regulation. We saw people in the thousands who joined regularly our offerings. We definitely helped them to get through the lockdown and then whatever next period of ways of working will be around the corner. You already mentioned the measuring part, which is the next topic that I wanted to talk about with you. It's always a tricky one. How did you make sure that you have measurable interventions or how much was it, you know, a quest from the leadership team? And then uh, if this was happening, how much could you then connect it to wider culture transformation initiatives? I, th I think I mentioned at the beginning that we took a very agile approach. So we, we did something, we uh, identified how we're going to measure it. We measured it, we run the experiment, we measure it, we learn from it, and, and we do the next one. So uh, at the beginning of the lockdown, almost three years ago now, we obviously ask, did you like that webinar? So the classical questions. Now, fast forward three years, we are now at the position as we work very, very closely with our behavior scientists in the organization, as well as people analytics. So those who have access to the Our Voice results, those who have access to other surveys that leaders or associates are doing in Novartis. And if you then coordinate and correlate those surveys with concrete behavior changes. For example, concrete behavior changes could be measured by Microsoft. Do you have focus time in your calendar? We could demonstrate that once people attend our webinars and they have been explained about the importance of those focus times, we saw an increase before the intervention and after the intervention. What is still unclear to us, whether this focus time is used in the way it was meant to be, or do you use the focus time to do all the emails or, or do whatever. So we, we are getting better and better, but it remains a very individual subject. While we see a positive trend, we have to be careful that we don't draw the wrong conclusions. 
And I found another one very interesting. Time the computer is on has increased significantly. So the first thing in the morning when you're at home, you turn it on, 7 o'clock, 7.30. And the last thing in the evening, you turn it off, 8.30, 9.30. So when you assume that the associate is working from 7.30 to 9.30, you would say they must feel exhausted sooner or later. And so you could draw the wrong conclusion and say, this population of associate is at risk of a burnout because they work every day 14 hours. But if you then do uh, focus groups and interview those people, they say, I use the time from 7 to 8.30 to work on it. And then from 8.30 to 10, I take care of my kids or my parents or I do sports. So actually, while the computer is on, they don't work 10 or 12 hours. At the beginning, we draw the wrong conclusion, say, oh my God, the time of people being online goes up significantly. There's a big risk of burnout. Actually, it wasn't the case because we really looked into it and found out that it doesn't necessarily mean that you work 14 hours. You have that flexibility to work differently. Thanks for being honest about these uh, learnings. It's just really good to hear how you, you learned on the way, wrong conclusions, and then yeah. you got better and better. This goes into the vulnerability, right? And that's also part of well being to lead by example. How do you see at this point well being will evolve? at Novartis and beyond Novartis? What's your view and vision? The definition of well-being has already significantly evolved from probably three, four years ago. I always say it was outsourced. So you work from eight to five and then you take care of your well-being from seven to eight. You go to the gym or, or do something else. So it was not part of your day because during the day you work. With hybrid working or with lockdown, obviously that has changed significantly. And there's already a very different understanding of well being. My dream is really that every single associate or every person around the world is basically five, 10 times during the day closing their eyes for one minute and tune into your body and realize what's going on. I have a headache, I'm angry, I'm exhausted, uh, I'm thirsty, there's little oxygen in that small room that I'm sitting or my neck or my shoulder is burning. And then you do a micro practice based on your insights from your body. And if, you, if everyone would do this, I'm pretty sure that the well-being of the world would increase significantly. Um, and so my big wish is increased self-awareness, have the right tools to, once you are aware of what's going on inside you, address it with things that only take two or three minutes rather than make it a big deal of, oh my God, I need to do exercise an hour each day. That is probably not sustainable. So break down the well-being into small bits and pieces. That would be my wish. That's a long journey, but exciting. And I see it at myself that there are days when I ignore my body. I'm looking at the screen the whole day. And at the end of the day, my back is aching or I have a headache because I didn't drink enough. Yeah, I, I hear the word awareness at all people in the world become more aware of their well-being and the state of mind. This is also how um, I got more into this topic through the corporate athlete theory back then. I really like the approach of, you know, having the pyramid, a bit like the Maslow pyramid with the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. And then when you feel that something is not right, you feel unwell or just some tension, then you can check on all levels of the pyramid yeah, where exactly. might be the yeah. gap. Yeah. yeah. 
You mentioned that the self-awareness would be the idea of future. There is always the question how much it is a personal responsibility or an employer's responsibility. And nowadays, with all the movement around the well-being in organizations, we are really tapping into the responsibility of employers. Yeah, exactly. And I think what is important, and I'm glad you clarified this, because people might have the wrong impression and say, we, we still have many leaders in Novartis, when they hear self-awareness, they believe, oh, now everyone needs to meditate half an hour each day. And meditation is not for me. So what is important is that we are looking and want to hold our leaders accountable for certain outcomes. So in our case, it's curious, inspired, unboss. So if you don't have that awareness, you might not be able to be inspired, curious, and unboss. And so we can hold leaders to account to demonstrate that we can't hold them to account that you meditate. And that's where, again, the self-awareness kicks in because I personally, I meditate regularly throughout the day for a minute in order to be aware of what's going on so that I can be curious, inspired, unbus. Others might do different things, uh, yoga, tai chi, walk out in nature, uh, watch a YouTube video, whatever. As long as you take care and be aware of what's going on, that's fine. So we mm -hmm. can hold to account for the outcome, but not how to achieve that outcome. So we will never get, hopefully never get to a situation where a company mandates you have to do this because that would not be justified by well-being. We are at the end of the podcast. So I have the two last quick questions for you. And you also did answer already one of them. What is your personal well-being hack or how do you take care of your well-being personally? I don't get paid by the aura ring, but I have the aura ring since about two years. And every morning it gives me feedback about my sleep quality and sleep is so important. So if there is one thing, take care of your sleep, quantity and quality. My wife is saying, I don't need the aura ring. I know how well I slept. I need data that gives me black and white indication of my night. So that's the one thing, prioritize sleep. And then the other is really build in those micro breaks throughout the day. And this example with your wife, it shows beautifully how different we are, right? One of yes. us is more yeah. about uh, <laughs> intuition, the other one really yeah. wants the data. And the last question, what would be your advice for other well-being leaders? the future leaders of well-being. In an ideal scenario, you have the senior leaders in the organization asking you for your support to bring in well-being into the organization. But I would say, if not, start from the bottom up. So we in Novartis, we had employee resource groups. Be Mindful was one. Uh, we have many initiatives that come up from the bottom up and they ultimately reach uh, the senior leaders and, and increase their awareness. So ideally, combination of bottom up and top down, start small, but start. <laughs> Great advice. Urs, thanks a lot for your time and being here with us today. We are very excited to hear also what comes up next for you and looking forward to meeting you again. Wishing you all the best in your journey. Thanks for having me, Reka. I enjoyed the conversation. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Wellbeing Designers podcast. To join the movement of the well-being designers, reach out via LinkedIn or email hello at rekadeak.com, R-E-K-A-D-E-A-K. -E -E I am keen to hear about your story, your ideas, and feedbacks. Together, we can design the future of well-being and make workplaces fit for humans.
Thank you.